So, good morning, and thanks for joining me. Um, it's great to be here. It's my fourth time in Build Stuff as a speaker audience. So, it's great to um, be here and see so many familiar faces, and thanks for joining. So, let me introduce myself. I'm a solution architect for a company called ASOS. ASOS is a global fashion retailer, and it's essentially um, has taken over the uh, Marks and Spencer as UK's largest fashion retailer. Um, and what I do is that I um, work as a solution architect for a recommendation platform. And what we do is we essentially take the um, user interactions and turn them into personalized experience using machine learning. Um, just to give you a kind of scale that we have to operate in, um, this coming Black Friday, in a couple of weeks, we are expecting on one of our APIs around 1,200 requests per second at peak, and this is why it hasn't been fully utilized. Um, so next year, we're expecting a lot more. Some of the APIs are expecting around uh, 10,000 requests per second. So. I was a Microsoft MVP, um, so my claim to fame was short-lived, but I have been very active in the API and REST community. I've contributed to this book. Um, and what we're going to do today is, because RPC is very old, and the criticism to RPC also very old, we have to look at the history. After this, uh, we're going to look at the forces behind RPC's resurgence. And then we're going to look at an example with some sample codes, so you will be able to see some code, it's not just talk, um, that we're going to take, break down a very simple example uh, using gRPC. And in the end, we're going to look at the RPC versus res and the fallacies around it. I don't know if it is a sign of the age, but I've recently been very interested in history. I generally believe that patterns do repeat themselves in history. For example, um, you probably are familiar with the um, tulip mania in 1630s and how it um, um, exactly um, mapped out the elements of financial crash, something that we might witness soon with cryptocurrencies, perhaps? Who knows? But, um, so this, I want to go back a long, long time before that. Um, and th so they found this very, very old sketchbook in France, um, which dated back to uh, 1230s, around 800 years ago. And this belonged to a man called Villard d'Ornecourt, and for those French people, if I've butchered his name, I'm sorry, but um, he was a man that lived around um, kind of today's Paris area and uh, seemed to be familiar with the architecture. Um, and he, his sketchbooks actually teaches us a lot about uh, how people lived and how people um, thought. And the sketchbook has many, many um, interesting pictures, and some of them clearly shows grasp of perspective, which is for the time is quite uh, impressive. But the most famous of all sketches was the one at the right, which is showing a perpetual motion machine. So perpetual motion machine was a device, as you can expect, um, expect that basically, with no energy input, can maintain the motion indefinitely. The first reference is actually, we have to go um, a century back to, to India, Bhaskara, where he was um, the first person to actually um, describe Bhaskara wheel. And the one in the middle you see is Tokola's overbalance wheel. Many, through the centuries, many small and large um, models of it was built, but as you can expect, they didn't live up to expectation. 
Even Lord Leonardo da Vinci was very interested and fascinated by it and you know, created um, some sketches of it which survive until today. But hold that thought for a bit because we have to go back to it in the end. And I'm going to take you through the history, through the centuries to 1970s, and to be exact, 1976. At this time, as you can see, there was a lot happening in the world. But in the meantime, some people at ARPANET trying to connect um, their computers, um, which were mainframe. And as you probably know, ARPANET is grandfather of today's internet. So they're trying to connect these mainframes and share their resources. And in fact, they haven't tried to do that since 1972. But they felt they needed a framework, a protocol. So James E. White comes up with RFC 707, proposes a function-oriented protocol, and he calls it PCP, or Procedure Call Protocol. And as we would read here, it essentially would elevate task of creating applications to defining procedures and would encourage and facilitate the work of the programmer by extending local resources by remote ones. And this R RFC is, is known as the, the first draft of what would known to be RPC, although the name would come in five years later. This draft would advocate modeling resources at oper as operations. I cannot think history could have been even more um, ironic because in two decades we would try to do exactly the opposite with REST. But anyhow, the crux of this approach is a protocol and a runtime environment which makes the remote resources look like local. And as you can imagine, the, the protocol itself was, wasn't very elaborate. It was primitive compared to the systems we have today. And they defined request and response with these kind of optional transaction ID, you know, results, pretty much everything you expect. They did mention two problems. One of them is that, you know, yes, it looks like the same, but remote pro calls are expensive. And the other one essentially was the problem of control, because locally the control flow is, is known and fixed in the remote systems is not. But the gold standard of RPC would come with Burrell and Nelson in 1984 and became the de facto recipe for, for RPC system. And Nelson, in fact, himself um, spent his, his thesis on that uh, and published in 1981. And these two actually had all the right to uh, publish this paper which essentially, because they had built one using the CEDAR programming language. And this, this diagram is taken from one of the um, pages of, of the paper. And as you can see, pro probably recognize um, this workflow, which is very much similar to what you would have in RPC today. Although their work was significant, and even they had security, but it was single-threaded and specific to Xerox Park environment and, you know, small lands. But criticism, it's funny that uh, RPC is one of those first kind of, uh, one of those um, things that the criticism came before. So this is, this is a very nice reading, and although it's from 75, I highly recommend. And Richard Chance, he said PCP is not going to make building um, distributed systems easier. And as you can see, so it can neither directly nor accurately model the interactions and control structure that occur in many distributed computer systems. And he essentially outlined 10 different pr problems, and I, I highlight some of them here. Um, for example, recovery from component fail malfunction, who in this room hasn't dealt with that? Um, sequence of procedures, you know, if you have to call them in order, this is about granularity of, of the, the API design, parallelism, synchronization, 
you know, and this fourth item essentially is, is talking about um, um, streaming, lack of streaming. Um, this one, lack of QE, priority, and it said didn't have any security. This is a fascinating read. Um, another one, 1988, two Dutch um, um, computer scientists published this paper, and they start with saying, <laughs> they started their paper with saying that, you know, uh, RPC has achieved sacred cow status. And they basically divided the problems into conceptual, uh, technical, and performance. And in the end, they basically target the heart of RPC. It says, and they are saying that, you know, yes, you can make the, this transparent, but, what, but there will be problems. And you can code to get around those kind of problems, but then transparency is lost. And if transparency is lost, you would wonder, actually, this kind of uh, model of um, semi-transparent model is, is doing any benefit for RPC. The last one I, I want to refer to um, is actually reads very much like um, it was written yesterday because a few years past TCP/IP became quite popular, network-based systems started uh, crop around here and there, but then came object-oriented programming and Java. And now people started talking about um, remote objects rather than remote procedures. So the first thing that came up around that was CORBA, which is Common Object um, Request Broker Architecture. Uh, so Jim Waldo started, uh, joined the force, started working with it, he wasn't really happy what, uh, where it was going, and in the end, he was so fr frustrated that essentially rage quit. And this is kind of his "I'm leaving .NET," you know, thing. That you know, it's it's not. It turns out, you know, .NET developers they were they are not the people who invented you know "I'm leaving X," but. It, as I said, is, reads quite, quite nicely. It's one of, one of the good papers. Um, and says that we argue that objects that, are, um, that interact in a discrete system intrinsically different. And then he goes on to say that communication between parts of the discrete systems is not a problem. Actually, connecting systems to each other is not a big deal. But... The problem is dealing with all these distributed problems, uh, distributed computing problems that, that we face every day. And in the end, they say rather than trying to merge the local and remote, we just need to remind it constantly that they are different. Um, RFC, there was another um, um, RFC came up, they had an opportunity to fix some of the problems, but they really didn't. And um, I just mentioned for the reference here. So late 90s, Corba and DCOM were very popular, and people started to talk about how they can communicate these. And XML was here to save the world. Anyone here from those days remember the like XML uh, fanaticism, you know, it, it was those days, you know, like everyone felt, oh man, everything has to be XML. Um, and it's kind of quite unfortunate that REST came out around 99, 2000, and SOAP's first uh, draft was in year 2000, and sport distributed computing for all of us. Um, but it was only around 2007 that we we recognize, you know, all of this kind of uh, overhead that we're building into SOAP is basically essentially counterproductive. But this is from Steve Vinovsky from 2002, and he recognizes, you know, even back then that uh, REST is, is, um, is the correct solution for the web. So, we've lived through REST domination for a decade. And 
What made some people to go back, try to think about RPC? And as I will explain, you will recognize that it has little to do with, with any shortcoming of RPC as an architectural style. And it's more to do as a culmination of various industry forces that making RPC a more practical choice. And I will try to mention some of them. So one of the reasons RPC made a comeback was because they never went away. So Google has been using RPC internally um, and using Stubby, Facebook and Uber, they have been using Thrift, and Twitter, Finagle. So it is true that REST APIs have been used publicly. You prob probably have used the public API, but internally it has been all RPC containers. Anyone here using containers? Yeah, a few hands. Who is using more than 100? Well, I see one hand. Who is using more than 10,000? Anyone? OK. So people who have, are using um, containers at that level will tell you that is the biggest problem with, you, with using containers in that scale. Essentially, the, the traditional networking melts down under the pressure. And Google has been, um, a few years ago, said that and they're, they're um, running 2 billion containers every week. And so they have been all trying to make this more efficient. And HTTP2 is something that they've been working on. And HTTP allows for reuse and uh, multiplexing. So it is much softer on network. And that's one of the reasons they are coming up with this. And obviously, you know that for everything, there is a host. But host runs different VMs. And then you run different containers. The reality is everything has to go through the same um, handful physical network interfaces. People have come up with different ways of solving this. You might have heard about it. Um, overlay, underlay. So the bridge networking is the default one, but uh, overlay, underlay is, is, is another one. James Nugent um, is going to talk more about uh, networking. I think that's, that's a session in case you're interested. Microservices. So I don't know who was here uh, last year. I had a uh, talk about microservices. Anyone from here from last year? Yeah, I think a couple of people. So we talked about the outliers of performance. And the outliers of performance is essentially what you're trying to target. And if you can reduce that using a more um, performance method is, is an option you would take. If you're running many, many containers, if you can make that more efficient, it means more costs. Now, one of the good things about REST, probably if you've, you've known, is how this is very important about um, evolvability. But then you look at the uh, RPC, it's not ev evolvable, but people are looking at actually adopting it for the safety. Uber is one of those ones. They basically found that um, the poor performance and uh, inconsistencies within their REST API, they made, you know, then decide to move to Thrift. And also enforcing governance. Again, uh, Uber was, was a good example. I've put these, these kind of blog posts there if you want to have a, a read more. But essentially, they, they use this to, to enforce um, governance on, on their teams without removing the autonomy. So anyone here does go, like professionally, there are probably a few, few people. So you, it seems like go, the reason that it's very popular is because of it's very lean. And being lean essentially mean, means cost reduction and having less footprints. And 
That's the reason that you see in some of these recent papers, when they talk about distributed computing, they just want to use RPC. And this one for machine learning, the other one for blockchain. So this seems to be a trend in there. If someone told you that by using a technique, they're going to increase the lifetime of a battery twice, would you consider it? You'll probably start thinking about it. So I yet haven't seen any um, kind of empiric evidence, but just anecdotal evidence seems to be piling up that using RPC potentially could, could um, help with CPU usage and battery life. And for IoT systems, this is essentially is a very important thing. So HTTP2. HTTP2 is more performant. It allows for HTTP compression, uh, header compression. It allows for streaming. We're going to see an example of that. It reuses the same connection and allows for multiplexing. The difference of multiplexing with pipelining, which we had in HTTP 1.1, is that with, uh, with pipelining, you get head of line blocking, which means that first request has to come back um, for the response for the first request has to come back before the, the rest can be accepted. That problem doesn't uh, exist in here. But now, with, this is all well and good. Anyone here using HTTP2 on their server side between server server communication? Anyone? Well, that's why. That's why basically they're trying to promote. Uh, RPC, because they are saying that for free they could start using, using HTTP2 between your service, server communication. I mean, if you have looked at the examples, it's actually very, very difficult to write th th that kind of code to multiplex around various um, requests and everything. So, decades of distributed computing experience. Yes. I agree. Um, I was having a, actually a conversation with someone about, about RPC, and they said, you know, like, if you are saying that RPC is not about local versus remote transparency, then it's not RPC. I think I would agree with that, but, you know, this is, this is, this is what industry is referring currently. And we could, I would tend to Look at this in terms of traditional versus true RPC. True RPC is old and is not good. The new RPC is here, I believe, to stay. So with that, let's move on to gRPC as an example of RPC. So I, I guess you guys have already are aware that gRPC is, is making noises and some people are adopting it. Thrift and Finagle, there are two other RPC frameworks. So Thrift um, are currently mainly used for a serialization platform. Finagle, it's a protocol agnostic protocol. It's, it's very uh, RPC system. It's very very good. Um, you can you plug in HTTP one, HTTP two, um, and it is quite interesting. But it's not as widely adopted as gRPC. So what is gRPC? gRPC relies on HTTP2 for transport and protobuf as message protocol. And essentially, it's ideal for server-to-server -server scenarios. However, people are saying, actually, you can use it on native app and IoT devices. As I said, this is probably an area that we need to look more and better and look, look for um, um, kind of uh, more empiric evidence, but that seems to be going pretty well on server side. So cross platform, you can use it on ten different languages, so including C sharp for those of you who probably .NET developers and as I have been um, reusing the same connection. So we talked about it. You know, if you have so many of these. Uh, microservices, they, they're going to connect to each other. You end up with, with, with problem if, if you keep 
making connections, creating new connections. Um, so this, this, is, this is very useful. Two-way communication through a stream. So it supports server to client streaming, client to server streaming, and um, kind of two-way streaming. It's very good. We're going to look at an example. Uh, security is through TLS, but if you want authentication or authorization, you have to kind of plug in yourself. You can write middlewares. It's pretty easy. You know, it's, it's due to because it's run in HTTP, kind of works pretty well with the um, with existing kind of uh, authentication scenarios we've had. So let's have a look at the demo. Um, right, I need to. Okay. So essentially, this is where you start from. This is IDL, but is the protobuf, protobuf version of the IDL, as you can see. And it's, it's not rocket science, you know, basically you are defining, okay, I've defined my mini service, um, this is add request, then add request is defined here, what, what the uh, schema is, and returns add response. Now, I have a streaming case as well, which basically report position. So this is, let, let's think about like a um, kind of um, I, um, like Uber scenario where, where uh, the, the car, the driver has to report its position um, so that they, they can optimize the, um, their algorithms. And then you, you see you have to define, you know, kind of the ordering. Again, that's, that's specific to Protobuf. And in terms of the other one, you know, we have, we have essentially these are two different things. Adding two numbers and the other one reporting position of the client. Right? What you do, then you have to basically generate... Yeah, you have to generate um, the code. I can actually delete. So you see, you see there are two files here, uh, mini gRPC and mini gRPC gRPC. So the proto is, is the protocol, uh, protobuf IDL. And I can delete those C-sharp files and regenerate using this, this um, shell script. But bear in mind, this shell script is nothing but it basically uses a tool to generate from IDL. So let me just... Uh, right, and look at this. Okay, I got rid of them. Now I'm going to run generate proto. Okay, so I got them back. This sample is on my GitHub. I will publish the address. Um, also, the, all the slides will be published as well um, after the talk. But this is .NET Core. I just want to build this. So I go here, .NET build. Right, I'm going to look at the client while it's building at the client and server. So essentially, this, this is very, very simple. You look at the server here. So all it does is basically does the add. It just sends a response. That's nothing complex. The second one is essentially gets the stream. And what it does then basically um, iterate through the stream while it can be iterated, and every time it comes out, it just just um, outputs the to the um, console. The program is nothing fancy. You know that's that's very simple. The client, 
we have the here. So basically, client accepts a command line parameter. And then we just create a channel on that particular address. And what we do is that create a client and then basically um, do these. So in here, we just client add request, simple. But I've moved this to acid trip. So the client essentially loops 10 times and every time just, just changes slightly the, the uh, coordinates and the reports. Look at here. Essentially, this says at the end that I'm done with the uh, stream. So this is notifies the server that, you know, I'm not going to publish anything more. And next line is then it waits for the response and publishes this response. So as you could see, the server was basically outputting and at the end will say, you know, like bon voyage. So I think we're going to see that. So it's built successfully. I go to server. Um, right, so .NET run. I need to specify the framework, .NET Core App 2. Anyone using .NET Core yet? I think, yeah, a few people. Right, 